for joining our weekly live podcast interview for the Transformation Ground Control podcast. Uh, if you don't normally watch the Transformation Ground Control podcast, it's a podcast that we release every week, every Wednesday. It comes out, streams to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can also go to transformationgroundcontrol.com to see past episodes of that show. And uh, by being here today, you're part of a live production of the podcast. So thank you for, for joining here today to all of you that are joining here. Um, today's topic is the role of user experience in digital transformations, which is a topic that is super interesting, although we've never talked about it on the show before. So I'm excited to cover this topic for the first time on this podcast. I'll introduce our guest here in just a moment. Um, but before I do, just a couple of logistical things. One is if you have questions along the way for myself or our guest, please chime in at any point as we're going through the conversation here. We'll keep an eye on the chat and the, and the live streams here on all the platforms that we're streaming to here today. So be sure to drop those questions or comments in the chat as we go. And speaking of the chat, if you don't mind dropping in the chat, what city and country you're joining from today, we'd love to hear where the global audience is joining from today. We usually get people from all over the world and I'd love to hear what city and country you're joining from. So please drop that in the chat as well. And uh, secondly, the, uh, the interview we have today, as I mentioned, will become edited and polished and we'll add some additional content to it. It'll become part of next week's Transformation Ground Control episode. So again, if you go to transformationgroundcontrol.com, you can see past episodes, everything leading up to this episode. And then of course, when this episode comes out next week, you'll see it there at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So uh, our topic today is the role of user experience in digital transformations. And just to give a real, real quick backdrop, I was, I was telling our guest here before um, we got on here today or before we went live, that this is one of those topics that I sort of knew about in the, in the background. I kind of knew what user experience was and customer experience and employee experience, but I never really heard anyone articulate it as clearly and as intriguingly, if that's a word, uh, as our guest here today. So, so, so I'm excited to have our guest on to, to chat about it. And um, joining us here today is Noon Esposito from Infor, which is a, an ERP um, software vendor. So Noon, thank you for being here today. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. Yeah, absolutely. Before we, before we jump in, I appreciate having you. I appreciate you being here today. Uh, but before we jump into these questions about user experience and how it relates to digital transformation, uh, maybe just tell us a little bit about about yourself, and then once you've done that, maybe tell us a little bit about Infor and who Infor is. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is uh, Nuncio Esposito, but everybody could just call me Nuns uh, for short. Um, I oversee uh, our global design program um, here at Infor. Uh, I've been at Infor for almost a decade now which uh, you know, seems like a long time, but uh, it's been very fast paced uh, in various roles. Um, and you know, one of the big things that I think we've been spearheading along the way is making sure that design doesn't just have a, a, a seat at the table when it comes to executive decisions and potentially like business or product strategy. It's more about getting deeper into the ebb and flow in the way in which software development um, basically gets made and ensuring that um, there's you know proper collaboration and uh, good support to ensure that we uh, we're always fo focusing on the end users' outcomes. Um, so you know, very excited to be uh, with you today, sharing in this dialogue. Absolutely. Now, was your your role at Infor was that a new role that was created that you sort of filled um, when you took that role, or is it something that had existed even before you were? The no. I'm just curious. Yeah, no, it, it, that's a good question. It did exist before. Um, you know, it, there was a leader, my predecessor, um, that really, I think, forged and pioneered the idea that uh, we needed design to be part of software development. As you can imagine, you know, very feature, feature function driven, um, which I, I would say most large enterprise uh, software providers, um, you know, it's the thing that they should be doing really well. Um, so it was definitely pioneered there, uh, formed in 2012. Mm. But um, I think the difference from where it was then in its uh, infancy to where we are now in our maturity, the difference was it was a centralized design team, which was very much like a design agency at the time. Um, and I think a lot of the challenges that it had was uh, design designs and design ideas, ideation, design specs was kind of like handing it over the fence, which was basically like, here you go, neighbor, do something with this. Right. Um, and that only goes so far. 
uh, a lot of things get lost in translation, uh, especially as you move toward more uh, modern agile practices. You really want design to be embedded. So in 2018, when I was asked to lead the global team, um, that was one of the big, I think, change management opportunities that I saw ahead with my with the org as we were rebuilding, which was how do we get closer to the dev centers? How do we get closer to uh, the end user? And how do we get more upfront access when it comes to where product management plays, which is the balance between product strategy and business strategy um, so that we can make better informed decisions. So that's been the journey that we've been on. Very interesting. Yeah, and it's interesting to think that there's a whole function and a whole competency within companies like Infor that are solely focused on that user design and user experience. And I think Infor has been sort of a pioneer in that thinking because I think, um, you know, with with a lot of their focus over the last few years and the strategy of the company, it seems like user experience is a core sort of a tenant of the of the overall strategy and what the value proposition of, of the product line is. Um, before yeah, we right. jump... Before we jump into all this user experience stuff, and I've got a ton of questions for you here, and I know the audience will have questions too. Uh, one thing, sure. just sort of reading up on your profile and learning a little bit about your background leading up to today, I, I saw that you like to restore British chariots in your spare time. Can you tell us a little bit? Just, <laughs> that, that sort of jumped out at me, and I'm like, British chariots? I don't know. I, yeah, I, I yeah. So, with that with that passion project. So tell us a little bit about I guess. That. Yeah, so I, I'm so obviously my nationality is Italian, um, and Italian car designers actually did a lot for British chariots. Um, I call it chariots just to be cheeky, but um, right. I restore old uh, MGs uh, and Triumph vehicles. I do it in my spare time. And I really have a passion for it because I'm a tinkerer. I can never sit still. Um, so if I'm not working, I'm in my garage. Uh, and the way that I approach looking at those cars is really around having an appreciation for what they were and what what kind of experience that they were uh, designed against and designed for, but it's all about how do I modernize it for today's times? Um, you know, be more safety, better performance, maybe some electronics that actually don't bust and break down. Right. Um, and I find very strong parallels between, you know, uh, historically, what is an ERP and how are we modernizing that ERP for today's times um, to enrich the experience for the users and not just deliver on the business promise. So there's, there are alter worlds, alter parallels, but uh, there's a lot of similarities. So thanks yeah. for asking. Yeah, it's got, I imagine that's a, a creative outlet for you as well. And just sort of a different, totally. different way than, than you're used to. Totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Very cool. So, so just starting with the basics, if we sort of back up and let's just assume someone like me doesn't know anything about user experience, I have no idea what it is. I've heard the, I've heard the term UX or user experience. Um, how would you sort of simplify it and explain it in layman's term? What, what is user design and why is it so important to digital transformation? Yeah, so, one, so user experience, one is the practice, um, which I think is, you know, uh, if someone is a user experience designer, uh, you'll hear terms like product designer. Uh, you and then you get into the cross gamut, which is like content strategy, content design, UX engineering, and front end development, and you get into all these these facets of what user experience is as part as part of a career and skill set. But I think for the audience, what really matters is is focused on the end users' uh, workflow and business process that they have with the software, and making sure that they have what we call modern affordances. And an affordance is like, these are like baseline expectations of how the software should work and engage with the user all the way up to how can we make them as our CTO and president says more productive. Um, and our team is driving not just user productivity, but more importantly, how do we give a better sense of meaning and purpose at work? So we call that user satisfaction. Um, those are the things like it works, it looks good. And we, I think we should definitely talk about how uh users do judge a book by its cover okay mm -hmm. um but it's not just how it, it works and how it looks but um it really fulfills the promise that it's supposed to deliver uh meaning i know where i am it's easy to navigate uh between different modules or different processes i know what buttons to click on the interface and oh by the way i hope that icon actually makes some sense um so it's 
it there's you know you could slowly start peeling the onion and getting into the layers of the depth of an, a user interface but um it really has everything to do with the moment the user logs into uh the software um and what they have access to and then being able to be as productive and as satisfied as they can uh with performing their job functions um at their place of business yeah 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 that's super interesting and when one uh tiny little nuance. I remember you talking about in a conference, I saw you present at an in for now conference several weeks ago in, uh, yeah, that's where we met. That's, yeah, where, that's I met. where I met you. And I said, Hey, will you be on my podcast? Cool. Um, <laughs> it was because, uh, because I love the the presentation because I'd never, I'd seen presentations on user experience before, but it tended to get really like super deep into the specs, if you will. Whereas I felt like you mm -hmm. explained why some of the specs were so important. I really liked it. And one thing I remember it jumped out, you were talking about the the spacing of fonts or something like that and how that can affect oh, icons icons yeah. yeah we were talking about icons yeah and you were talking yeah, so about there's... how there's some sort of study or science behind how it affects the person's perception of, of their job or something i can't remember i, I apologize I, I don't recall more than that but i do remember no, it's okay being super intrigued by that can you tell us a little bit about like that and other what are some of those other little nuances that people may not think about when they think about user design yeah sure so so it could get very complex really quick so yeah. I don't want to get I don't want to get the audience too lost in the sauce, as I would right. say, or getting too meta. But but you know the one piece that you're calling out is with our low level uh, icons, which we call system icons. Those are the things that I think uh, users take for granted, and um, you know uh, I would even say software vendors take for for grant, uh, software providers take for granted too. It's the things like you know um, what what is the icon that you should have for save functionality. Or uh, what icon should you have for home or user profile? And those are some simple ones, but it gets very complex once you get into. I'm looking at a list of records, and it, the record list is really dense. I mean, there's a lot of data on the screen. Um, and I need to be able to do a batch selection. And with that batch selection, I need to know how to override or edit what that selection is or I need to hit an icon that allows me to either open up or make more data density within the record lists. And all of these, all of these um, references or use cases that I'm giving, they all need to be um, conveyed in a very meaningful way that has to be juxtaposition to many other different functions what things not only what does it look like what kind of labeling does needs to be done what kind of testing do you need to do between geos it can mean different in different cultures and languages um so what we've been working on is taking a, a vast system icon library that we have which is um over a thousand elements and making sure that we are uh, creating better uh, visual recollection so you know the minute i see it the user should understand uh, what, it what it means and what it provides. Um, and how can we also account for the fact that in, you know, very um, feature rich applications, there's no, it's not like there's three or four icons on a screen. At times there could be like 15 or 20, depending on uh, the functionality of what it's providing. So what I was saying in that presentation was, we need to make sure that we're accounting for spacing, which is done optically. So you can imagine at a pixel by pixel level on in the interface, sure, there could be a good rhyme or reason to how you're going to either vertically or horizontally align those elements. But it's one thing to do that from a mathematical perspective, and then it's another to do it visually, which sometimes accounts for the nuance to account for the element in the shape of that icon. So we were calling it optical spacing. Um, so there's a balance between these things. It's like the art and science of design. Um, and that's what we, we've been overhauling to make sure that it not only w looks modern, um, but it doesn't create any visual vibration, um, in the interface. And those are things that I think a lot of software development teams take for granted, um, that could add a lot of, uh, low level, uh, UX value. Right. Right. Yeah. When I, when I think of user experience, um, the person that comes to mind is Steve jobs, like whenever I, I think of. <laughs> design and user experience and, you know, his, his innovation in, in tech, not only technology, but even just packaging, you know, you open a box with your iPhone 
that you know it's brilliant packaging it's very simple it it's was. easy to get you get started on using a product um but i remember him saying and, and i think he's, he's pretty well known for saying that he wouldn't do research to figure out what people wanted he would design something put it out there and sort of that agile mentality of just sort of um proactively anticipate what people want versus asking them what they want how, mm -hmm. how much mm -hmm. with user design and, and sort of your philosophy of it how much of it is sort of science-based as you mentioned versus like an art that you that you're sort of trying to shape and lead the user to, to if that makes sense I, you know how much of it is art versus yeah art yeah that that's actually yeah so that's actually a really good question and i should probably should have wore my turtleneck and needed a mock turtleneck <laughs> so i could channel right. channel my inner jobs um right. <clears throat> excuse me um i would tell you i think it depends on the audience in which you are uh, providing a service to through the through the software and i'm going to get to what i mean by that um and there's a lot of sayings around like you know if you i, I don't know it was like a ford motor company i i think quote that was said in the early 1900s which was like you know if you asked everybody what they wanted they wanted a faster horse they wanted to said they wanted the car right and i think those those types of people like you know henry ford with the model t or steve jobs with not only the apple computer but i remember the profound effect i had when i opened up my ipod when the first ipod came yeah. out you were you know you were like all this music fits in here you know you couldn't even fathom it yeah. um the reality is i think in general humans want to be surprised they want to know that if something is designed or really thought out really well it's that concept of like it not only looks good but it works good too and mm -hmm. it really fulfills that promise um ideally it should have a pretty long shelf life meaning um you know you might be applying iter iterative features or enhancements to something but it delivers that base that that base value and need and as it continues to evolve, you continue to make sure that you sprinkle in some of that surprise and delight, um, which I think, you know, UXers, um, I think they are, they have that very close to their heart, but it's not so easy to achieve all the time based on uh, specific requirements or needs or et cetera. So the reason why I, I say it that way to start is I think that there are two major divides in the enterprise space. Um, and I think a lot of what uh, CIOs and leads of IT departments that we work with are really grappling with, which is, hey, I have this, I have this constituent base, this employee base that has been using our business software for 15, 20 years. And you're going like, oh, wow, you know, like. You know, you, you, you account for that and you're like, okay, so the Windows operating system, was that like Windows 98? Was that 3.1? What's going on? Okay, so like that's that, you know, and then you start getting into like, man, they were using computers that turned yellow over time, you know, Manila. Right. You're like, okay, that's that base. Right. And then the other base is, which is a good segue to digital transformation, really gets into, you know, the up and coming employee or relatively new to the company doesn't need to be an age perspective it's just a demographic perspective early tenure early in career um and as they're joining um you know that hemisphere that divide that half it's all about like can this thing work faster can it look good um you know you're making me learn how to do this process and like man that feels a little clunky i don't understand why i have to go here and traverse to there and go everywhere i, I just want to do that in one spot so you have this dichotomy between and i don't like calling it legacy because i think that that is condescending at times i would just say like deep business ip and and knowledge and they've been and those constituents those users They've been trained, they've been educated, they found their own workarounds with the system and they become very hyper like change averse mm -hmm. at times. And yeah. then the other side is going, I don't wanna use this. I wish this thing could change. I wish it could change faster. Uh, by the way, I don't really like the way this looks and oh, you know, maybe you shouldn't tell me how to make, 
how I should do my job. I want to figure out how I want to do my job. And they're like polar opposites of this continuum. Right. And, um, you know, that's why I think at least myself and the, the team that we're building and how we approach it at Infor, um, you don't want to leave anybody behind, but you also don't want to just always solve for the deep IP users of a business because then you're leaving this door open for the what if and what's possible in doing it different. And those things are pulling at each other. And with the rate of change in technology, you can't you can't choose one over the other. Mm -hmm. And you need to take risks. And I think that's what that's what I liked about you know Henry Ford, Steve Jobs, and et cetera. It was just like there's got to be a better way to do this. And I want those users, those people, those customers to join that journey, and others will follow. Yeah. So there's got there's got to be a balance uh, in that. How much of what you do is informed by or influenced by or led by consumer grade technology and user design? So, in other words, I you in this triggered this question when you were talking about the the deep IP and the users that have been around a long time. They've worked around these difficult clunky systems and they found a way to make it all work. And then you've got the newer, younger employees that have never heard of a transaction code, for example, they don't, they can't even fathom yeah. the idea of a green screen with no graphical user interface where you have yeah. to memorize a transaction code that, that doesn't, that's like a foreign language to someone who's younger, to, who grew up on, you know, technologies like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, all that stuff. So how much of that type of technology, that consumer grade technology influences enterprise technology, or is there any sort of connection there in your mind? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> Um, I intentionally waited until you're about to cough to ask you that question. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I would tell you with the green screen thing, just as a, 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 a sidebar, um, what prompt engineering and prompt design that's happening because of Gen AI, I would tell you, you're going to see interfaces like that come back it's in coming style. Back. <laughs> um, now, you might not need to have to know the item code and you right. could just speak in, in, in human speak, like just simple, I need to process this or find this, but like, the interfaces are going to be getting um, very much simpler and and very um, two way dialogue because the system is taking on that burden. But um, you know, getting into the consumer grade experiences, I would tell you early at Infor, um, and I think design in general at the enterprise space. So I'm, I'm I'm thinking now I'm saying now broader than Infor. I think everybody was really gunning for what is that consumer grade experience for. Um, you know, feature rich uh, business software. I think that was, you know, that was the prize. It was mm -hmm. like, we need to focus on that. We need to do that. We need to get that. And if we could do that, you know, we're going to win. We're going to lead. We're going to lead in that space. Or we're going to be the number one vendor, the number one provider. Um, I would tell you, it's at a point where I think that a company, as they go to figure out what that means to them, um, and I mean that from a software provider all the way to, you know, uh, IT business choosing a vendor. Don't get enamored by the shininess of consumer grade or what is said, because it's about how it's actually really applied and saw and, and, and seen through to the, mm. the totality of what that offering is. So baseline to me, consumer grade is the user interface, not so much the UX side of the house. Right. the user interface it's what it looks like you know and those things should be very modern um there should be modern affordances if there's a you know a business user that is using office 365 and let's say for a crm they're using salesforce we need to make sure that the erp or the workforce management module or you know the product lifecycle management uh application it could it could it could fit in line is at in par, meaning it's a level playing field. Um, and it doesn't try to highlight one is more dated or, you know, one doesn't fulfill on that promise of the UI different from there. Now, ideally you want them all to be the same, but you know, that I think we should talk about it. Maybe that's a follow-up podcast because I do believe singularity will be achieved in, in, in a distant future, but you know, we're getting into like ethics at the same time. Right. But um, I, I, modern interface to me 
is the consumer grade experience. Um, you know, button styles, page layouts, form styles, um, iconography, like we were talking about, nomenclature, what things are named, is it, is it simple to understand and et cetera. When it gets into though, what it fulfills, meaning um, deep search functionality or how to better do simple things, uh, better perform simple things like CRUD functions or being able to parse multiple data sets at large volume and doing it in a very simple and meaningful way. To me, consumer grade helps to inform, meaning you can use it as an outside in agent to see how others are doing it. But when it applies to the enterprise space, you can't compare it apples to apples. It's, it's not like a binary transaction because what ends up happening is at least for what I've encountered and our team has encountered, you can solve for like one way of doing it. And then when you end up realizing is it's configurable 18 other ways. There's 72 other use cases that that user might potentially need to be able to perform this thing. Right. And the complexity that it's offering is so deep and vast that it's like, you get to a point you're like that consumer grade, like it won't even be able to hold water. Right. So it's a balance. Mm. And I think you take it face value initially, and then you get deep into what's the user, what are the use cases, and what is the hyper configuration that enterprise software needs to provide or account for. And then it's kind of like, use that as a guiding light, but don't use it as the only way in which you make the decision because you'll be putting yourself, you know, painting yourself or putting yourself into a corner. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, a good point. And, you know, the the needs and the business processes and the functions of an enterprise are much, much different, more complex than posting a reel on Instagram. You know, that that's. Yeah, yeah I, totally. I, I, I mean, I'm posting totally. a video real quick. It takes me 30 seconds and I'm done. This is what we're talking about here is something that someone uses five, six, seven, eight hours a day. They're engaging and interacting with a system to do multiple complex transactions. And so I think that's a it's an interesting balancing act you talk about there and a good reminder that it's not always going to look like Instagram or Snapchat or whatever consumer grade technology or you're, you're trying to compare your enterprise technology to. Yeah. So you just gotta, you gotta embrace, embrace the complexity and, yeah. and, and, and solve within the constraints. But I yeah. think that like, don't fight it. Right. And I think that that's been, that's culturally a big thing that I believe the design team here at Infor uh, learned as it, you know, it ramped up its maturity here. Um, and I feel like we're finally starting to pioneer how those product decisions get made so mm -hmm. that we can account for it. And it's very exciting, it's very yeah. exciting for myself. And I know it's very exciting for our team. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely, you guys definitely have a, a more of a focus on it. I'd say than a lot of, a lot of software and enterprise technology vendors and providers out there for sure. Um, here's a question that sort of comes back to a point you, you talked about a moment ago, noon. This is from Ryan on LinkedIn. And Ryan says, has the prevalence of AI changed or improved you and your team's ability to perform your roles? And maybe taking it a step further, sure. taking that question a step further, how is AI affecting the job and the role of user design, user experience? Um, how, how do you anticipate that AI will, especially generative AI, how, how will that impact user experience and user design yeah. going forward? Great question, Ryan. Uh, nice to digitally meet you. Um, <laughs> So, so there's many different facets of Gen AI, uh, and you know, uh, Infor is definitely uh, taking a strategic stance on this. Just come, just came out of a Gen AI summit a couple of weeks ago um, with cross-functional global leaders, so we can address those use cases and needs. When it comes to our team and the way that we leverage it, um, it's a really amazing tool to find out, find information that you sometimes ask yourself, you know, what if, or what don't I know that I need to know? So I'll give, I'll give an example. An example could be, I'm a shop foreman at a distribution center. I oversee, you know, a large warehouse and I have 15 employees. And in there, I need to make sure that I'm accounting for the speeds and feeds of the business so that I can perform my job functions and meet the demand of order volume and et cetera, right? So I'm just using this as an example. Mm 
Sure. Gen AI is awesome at, I am a user experience designer and I need to know this role. What does this role need? What is this role's pain points are? How can I liberate this role, meaning make their job easier or faster or more meaningful? It's awesome at parsing large volume of data like that and presenting it in a very simple, simple manner so that it is digestible and consumable to a designer to then take that information and really start to engage with product management or product owner or business analyst or a development engineer and asking questions. It's like, I look at it as it brings you to a level playing field when you might not necessarily have that end user knowledge. It's a place to start. Right. That's how I look at it. Okay. Right. Um, and our team's been leveraging it massive when it comes to uh, fulfilling user pro, uh, personas. So it's like in persona definition, persona writing. Um, but we don't take it for granted. We don't take it for bi binary sen sense, which means I ask a question, it gives me the, the result. And we're like, yep, that's it. You know, we definitely mm -hmm. want to validate that. Um, and on top of it, we want to make sure that it also has an in four point of view in it. We want to make sure that it is, um, we ask those specific questions to our current customers. Um, and we have some uh, proprietary tooling that uses, you know, customers in, in the market that are, don't use in four, but we have access to those users to fill in that information. Hmm. So, you know, we use it to speed up a lot of user research in simplest terms. It's awesome at that. Um, <clears throat> it's also great at doing things like checking code integrity or doing design QA uh, for our design system using like a, a repo and checking to make sure that it might have, you know, we uh, we're doing our, all our checks and balances for documentation. Um, can a system generate a UI based on some of those standards? So, you know, it, we're not trying to replace anybody, but we're trying to make sure that we're meeting a specific level of um, integrity and efficacy in our work. And it's really good at augmenting that as well. So that's how our team is using it right now. That's in, for internal means. When it comes to the business, um, we're looking at Gen AI in very profound ways. Um, as you can imagine, as a large enterprise provider, global, with large tenant rooftops, you know, like in specific industries, you're talking about 500,000 plus users. Or in other industries, you're talking about, let's say, a couple of hundred users, but each of those users are doing like six job functions. So, you know, large disparity there, but large volume. There's a ton of data. So how can we make better sense of that data? How can we present that data in more meaningful ways? How can we um, I'll, I'll let the business leverage that data to make better business decisions? But more importantly, how can we give very fast, quick recall or pro, pro, uh, proactiveness in what is being what's happening there what's learned and what could be applied so that a user can make you know quicker decisions or see what's going on so the way we're looking at that right now is in you know uh process like business process uh efficiency performance um and you know obviously it's the speed and feeds of the business and for an end user it's how can we meet that end user where they are uh given in the infor business ecosystem and make sure that they feel supported. You know, I need something or I can't find something or I want to know something. Um, and then how can we make that feel um, like it could complete a task for them? Meaning I, XPO needs to be adjusted for X quantities and I need to send out that update and response to blank. So quick, quick prompt, boom, performs it, gets the job done. So that's how we're looking at it in its... Um, as we iterate, um, iterate our way forward. Um, and then the hmm. third tier would be our customer base for Gen AI. And I think, you know, you, some questions you were telling me are UX, CX, EX that we're going to get into. Right. I think that any customer, any business provider um, that has a large employee base or a small rooftop, I would just start playing with it because you could get really amazed. You, you'd be really amazed at um, what it knows. And then once you start thinking about your data in mix with it, you know, it starts to really open up your mind 
um, at what its possibilities are. It's very profound. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And you, you sort of hinted at or, or provided a great segue into a follow-up question on that, which is you, you mentioned the acronyms UX, CX, and EX. And let's just unpack real quickly what each of those means or what, what they stand for. And then I, I want to ask you what the difference is and what they mean and how they, how they tie together. UX is user experience. There's CX, which is customer experience. And then EX yep. is another emerging buzzword, which is employee experience. So you get user experience. experience, customer experience, employee experience. What's the difference between the three and how do they all tie together? Oh man, should we ask ChatGPT? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <a> great <laughs> so the simplest way for me to explain it, or at least to put a frame of mind, user experience, it applies to both of those facets. It's the mm -hmm. base foundation because it doesn't matter what role you are, or who's using the system, um, you're classified as a user. And you need to make sure that it's fulfilling on the functions or the, you know, the business process, the job duties. Um, and it's doing it in a very simple and intuitive manner. Mm -hmm. User experience, base matter, baseline. It's in everything. It's in everything. And if it's not digital, it's even physical. Right. So um, it's just the way we live. It's the way we act. Um, I think the customer experience has everything to do with the large user segments. So this is now like all the constituents that, that make up a business. So it's the you know office of the C-suite, it's the C-suite, it's the line managers, it's the directors, it's um, you know, it's part-time or full-time employees. That that whole trail, if you were to package it all up and basically say, hey, we're a software provider. And we want to offer you the best customer experience possible, especially in SaaS. That has everything to do with you bought the software. It was easy to implement. And along the way, you helped me during that implementation. And I had questions and I needed to do some configurations or extensions. And that was easy to do and perform. We got up and running really quick. Um, you helped me with my training and documentation. Um, there were some pain points along the way, but it was really easy to pick up the phone and, and call someone and get my answers. And along the way, as you're doing these releases and these updates, the customer is getting more engaged, is going to you know um, software functions and events and wants to know more. And eventually, hopefully, can speak the praise of going, this software and this provider, I recommend them in the market, customer experience, which is like, you know, I, I think most um, vendors look at it as the NPS, which is like, you know, how high is the NPS, like the lovability of the vendor? And it has all these facets and all this criteria. That's how I phrase up the, net, the net promoter score. Is that what you're talking about? The Yeah, net pro yeah. Promo promoter score. Thanks for that. I, there's tons yeah. of acronyms. Right. <laughs> um, now, the employee experience, I think, is, is it lives between the two of those, at least from my perspective. And that has everything to do with is can the employee log into a system? And usually that is framed around human capital management or HR software, HR tooling. Mm -hmm. um, and it's easy to update my profile, have a change, a change of life. I got married, had a baby, got divorced, whatever it may have been. Um, and, you know, it's, it's helping me for a knowledge base, knowledge sharing, um, hopefully it can help me. How, how am I going to better my career? Uh, what kind of certifications do I need or criteria do I need to meet? Um, you know, it's the speeds and feeds of recruiting, you name it, employee experience. Um, and at times I think we see those things in the market as polar opposites between what is an ERP enterprise resource planning tool and the user experience there. And what does it mean for the employee experience and the user experience there? And I think that the closer that those can merge and blend, the better the uh, total package is going to be uh, from the vendor uh, to the customer. Mm. Um, and at least that's the way we're looking at it. Um, Interesting. So I hope that I hope that answers it. Um, yeah, you could definitely chat Jen, <laughs> chat GPT. Right. Right. Yeah. No, that's super interesting because those are three buzzwords you hear a lot. You know, UX, CX, and EX. So it's good to kind of see how they how they tie together. There's some Venn diagrams. I think there's some Venn diagrams on that too. Where do they overlap? 
who's at the center of it. Um, so definitely something worth re researching and then forming your own opinion on what it means. If yeah. you have to author it or if you're part of the vendor or you're, you know, making the software, it's how you look at it. Yeah. Now you, you alluded earlier, you, you sort of, you sort of, uh, glossed over an important point that I want to come back to you, which is the, um, and I don't mean glossed over in a bad way. I'm sorry. That came out, that came out of my mouth wrong. <laughs> I don't mean you glossed over it. You touched on something I want to dive into deeper. How about that? Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. So it was, um, you were talking about how user design and user experience oftentimes, I, I, I forgot the exact words you said, but you, oftentimes that gets judged. You judge a book by its cover, I think is what you said. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me how, how does your work and the user experience, how does that influence for better or for worse organizations um, assessment or evaluation of potential software options? In other words, does it help you sell I, more? Is Infor selling more software, do you think, as a result of this user experience that you've created with your team? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, look, you know, you from if you look at the lengthy sales cycle of what a typical uh, ERP contract is and you look at, you know, if uh, if someone's in the market for it and they're looking at various vendors, um, you definitely do judge a book by its cover. And I know I remember saying that when you were there in New Orleans with me. And right. what I mean by that is um, that's kind of like looking at something face value, which mm -hmm. is um, first impressions matter. That's basically right. what it means. So just like you have a guest, if you have someone coming over your house or your apartment or whatever, you know, you might have a side door. You can probably get into the house through the garage if you have a garage. But what do you do? You usually bring them through the main door, the entrance. It's the foyer. And right. it's supposed to put on my my nonna, you know, because I'm Italian. She'd say, you know, Nuncio, you got to make sure you put on a nice figure. What she meant was you got to show up. You got to dress the part. Um, you got to you got to be. Um, approachable and um you know it's put your best face forward so to speak mm -hmm. in layman's terms so i think uh that's where that's what i meant by the modern affordances earlier in this in this conversation around the user interface mm -hmm. it's what it looks like okay and those matter early in the sales cycle because you're just looking at it and you're going i want to know more mm -hmm. or you read that it it's a leader in this and this and it has this deep functionality i was looking for but what does it look like Right. It's just, you know, we're creatures of visual uh, criteria and, and judgment. I, 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 you know, it, it might sound like very superficial, but it, the veneer matters. It yeah, just does. It's, it's the reality. Everybody should just, yeah, everybody should just own it. Right. Um, so, so that's that part, right? But when you get deeper into the sales cycle, it has everything to do with the speeds and feeds of the user experience. Is this how how snappy is the software? Is does it load quick? Can I can I navigate to something really quick? Does it make sense? Um, if I'm trying to satisfy these two or three primary user roles or user types, do they see value in this? Do I want them to be part of that judging criteria and and get, let them get a taste for it? That's where the user experience, like the real actual like information architecture the performance, the intuitiveness of the application, that's where that really starts to elevate up. So you get, you get past the veneer, so to speak. Um, that's how I would answer that and look at it. But you never get to say the next sentence, in my opinion, or go past the foyer if it doesn't look good. Right. And um, you got to do it. So I remember sharing that with you we did some profound information architecture work and new navigation paradigms um, in some of our ER, in our ERP for services cloud, which covers like public sector, healthcare. Um, and we could have done it with the same navigation structure and component that we had, like we've had for four or five years. We still could have done it. Mm -hmm. But I remember when we were having this conversation with um, the dev leader at the time, and the head of product management, I was like, listen, doesn't matter if we did it. And yeah, it's going to be awesome and it's going to work. And it's definitely going to fulfill the promise of modularity and, you know, composable ERP, which is a marketing term, but, mm -hmm. you know, in design modules, more modules, less monoliths, so to speak. Right. I was like, but if we do not change the way it looks 
and the and and the interaction design of it, you know, if a user hovers or clicks, what happens? How does it behave? Then no one's going to think we changed anything. That's what we said. Right. So that is a success criteria for us to do this deep IA work. If it doesn't look different and engage with the user, interact in a different manner, then no one's going to know it happened. Right. So that's why I meant number one, you got to always focus on what it looks like. Um, and that at times is very challenging when you're trying to push large systematic change and you're trying to get massive volumes of adoption. Um, you can get a lot of backlash there. Uh, so it has, a, it takes a lot of design enablement um, right. that you have to account for, for the yeah. change. Yeah. So how do, how do enterprise tech buyers, you know, if I'm an organization or I'm part of a project team that's evaluating potential technology options and I've got my over on one hand, I've got my checklist of hundreds or even thousands of functional business requirements. Can the software do a, B and C sort of yes or no. And then over here, you've got this user design stuff, which is adding a little bit of gray to that evaluation, which is, yeah, it does it, but it's really hard to navigate or it sort of does it not, maybe not as ideal as we wanted to, but it's really easy to navigate. It's going to be easier for the user to figure out. So how do you, how do you translate all the stuff you're talking about? How do how can you translate that into actionable, measurable criteria for evaluating software? And how do you prioritize that against the more functional focused requirements that, that we're also used to? Yeah, sure. No, that's a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, maybe there could be a follow-up where we can list out like the top 10 of those because the, the, the KPIs and the success criteria could be very profound, meaning it could be very dense. Mm -hmm. Um, but some recommendations that I would have is if it meets, if it meets the feature functionality requirement, that deep list, you're going like, I have a hundred plus things this needs to do and vendor A can do it and vendor B can do it. The first success criteria then is without thinking of your very tenured and super business knowledge users, you have to think about like the future because the life cycle of these things is very long. Let's just go into three, five, seven, ten 10 years. Mm -hmm. You're signing on this like relationship with this vendor. Um, I would basically ask myself if someone was doing a change in career, if someone is fresh out of school, what's the face value of it? Would they go, this meets a modern business application software user interface? That's a first success criteria, I would say. Mm. And it doesn't need to be everywhere. And I think that that's where at times enterprise providers, they get dinged. I know we have in the past for full transparency, but we're addressing it. Um, it's how you tell it's how you engage in that story and how you explain that you can't change everything. You want to do the things that add the most value to the most users, largest base. And you want to navigate and scale that change over time, especially in the user interface. So it brings everybody along with them. Hmm. But this is the way you do it with newer tenured users. This is how you do it with deeper, more knowledge based tenured users. We call them like uh, super or power users to casual or lightweight users. That's mm -hmm. how we, we classify it in our culture. Right. Um, so first one would definitely be the interface. The next thing I think has everything to do with uh, speed and performance. And I think that we take for granted how quick and profound Gmail is, or, you know, like, uh, uh, let me say, uh, like Office 365, these things load quick, they perform quick and et cetera. Um, but I would really test it with large data. Um, so this is like deep data records. Cause some stuff, I still can't believe a user needs to see all these things in some of our ERPs. I can't, it's so profound, right. but it's like, how quick does it load? And in there, um, does it do progressive disclosure or do lazy loading? These are some uh, design terms, which is I can load a hundred records and I can scroll to like 80 and then it loads the next hundred. Or does it have to do batch processing? Or does the user have to click to load all those things? To me, those are dings. Those mm. are dings. They're not positive. Those are cons. Right. Um, I look at uh, page structure and information architecture. You know, navigation is really important when it comes to, um, especially in ERP and the modules that go around it. That's how we look at it in our cloud suites. Um, so navigation would be another KPI for me. 
terminology is another KPI. Like, do I need a PhD to understand what this rec ID and item number is? Or can I speak in, in human terms or do a simple lookup and have it, you know, recall or do an exact match to what this is? That would be a success criteria for me. Um, but the one big caveat that I would add, and then I promise you I'll shut up, um, <laughs> because this one, I'm very passionate on this because I think that we just look at the face value. We know, I know this is contradictory, but just understand it looks good. And if it looks good, it should perform really good. But at times something that is hyper performant and feature rich, and let's just say future proof mm. might not always look good and mm. you have to balance it Yeah, because that might be okay. There might be other ways to do it. So mm. um, I would tell you a reco for anyone that is purchasing is to make sure that you're doing your judging criteria and you have those two opposite sides in the ability to have decision rights or voting rights on who you select early tenured, long tenured. That would be the first, make sure you have that as part of the criteria. The second mm -hmm. one is, um, don't put yourself into a corner because something just looks really good and it seems really intuitive but it might not deliver on the longer term success of where the business needs to go, which I know is probably some of in our competitive space, not naming names. Um, and, and you really want to make sure you're looking towards the future. Right. And if you see a different way of doing things and that face value is delivered, then you have to have the confidence and the conviction that that company is going to fulfill that promise and is going to scale it out as much and as fast and as best as they possibly can. And Gen AI is going to take a lot of a lot of the uh, the lift at times. So I think that these ERP vendors, us and others, I think we're going to have to see a very profound shift. Um, and that consumer greatness that you're saying, I think we're going to be able to leapfrog it, given the data density that we have, the richness of business process, and the connectivity and extensibility. Um, I think it could be really the second coming of what ERP really is in a more focused and module based uh, solution. Right. Right. Here's a, that's a great, great explanation and great, great overview. Um, here's a follow-up question that sort of ties into this. Something you said earlier, this is from Dan on LinkedIn, who I happen to know is part of the Infor ecosystem. And he said, this mm. is fantastic. Nunzio, did you, did you do the same UX exercise with the manufacturing ERP as you did for healthcare and government cloud suites? Okay. And maybe I'll, That's a I good could, question. Me, could I add one little caveat to that or maybe broaden it a little bit? I, I just wonder with sure. Infor's, with Infor's composable ERP modular platform based strategy. And I'm, I'm, I apologize to your marketing people and your salespeople, but I, I may have butchered your, <laughs> your, the preferred messaging of what your uh, strategy is, but I, I view Infor's strategy is very focused on that composable ERP, building a platform, not just one single system that can do everything, but more of a, right. a platform. How does that, this UX, all this UX stuff you're talking about, how does that, does that get more complicated? Because now you're talking about different systems, like Dan says, you've got healthcare, yeah. cloud suite, government, uh, manufacturing. How, how do you address that in a composable ERP? It's super, yeah, it's, it's super complex. Like, let's just say it. Um, but that's actually what our differentiator is in the market. Um, you know, the industry specificity and these very deep, rich um, applications that really solve specific uh, business and, and user need. So I would tell you, this is the this is the simplest way that our team looks at it. It's not a one size fits all. Boom. Now, what does that mean? Um, you can have a design system, which is a basic set of design standards. Um, standards that not only uh, deliver and articulate the way in which to lay out the software, how to organize it, the the look and feel of it, et cetera. But go back to it's not a one size fits all. So what that means is you need to have a lot of variability or what we call variants of something. Um, and when you go to apply it, let's just use this module navigation that I was using earlier as a use case. When you go to apply it, it's not like what it does in Dan's point, you did this in services, did you do it in manufacturing? It's not one-to-one. -one. It's not mm -hmm. binary in that transaction. 
So you have to understand, you have to understand how the users are using the system now. And it actually is very different than our services section. Um, but it doesn't mean that you don't lose sight of the uh, top guiding principles or the core tenants in the why you were doing this thing. So ex some examples that we had were um, names need to be very simple and easy to digest. And I don't need like a dictionary to understand what they are. Right. That was one of them. Right. The next one is uh, the, the navigation tree. I don't want to see 75 links. I don't want to see 75 links. I want to see ideally seven, no more than 10. Hmm. And if you got to squeak by, I'll let you go to 13, but like now we're passing thresholds. So right. these were these, like these methodologies, these metaphors is the way that our team engaged with product development and um, product management. And that's how we made this profound shift in the services cloud. Mm -hmm. So to answer Dan's question, yes, the manufacturing uh, suites, they're on the roadmap. We just started doing the work. It should be done at least con uh, demonstrable and starting to be consumed at a module level by this time next year, mm -hmm. because it takes a lot of work. But what you see in services cloud is not going to be one to one to the way we do it in manufacturing. And that's because Infor's differentiator and IP is industry specificity, and it can't be a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And that's what we learned through our, through our design team. We created a design system that was supposed to be a one size fits all. And it got us to baseline consistency, but it didn't really deliver on the cohesiveness of mm -hmm. what it means to have multiple things come together in a very meaningful way. So that's the shift that we did. Um, so a term to look up, you could look up design systems and then you could look up subsystems, which means there's a root and they branch off to it and it it's translated differently given, you know, that application or who's consuming it. And that's the thing that we've, uh, we've definitely pivoted on. Um, and we're going to be doing more of here at M4. Hmm. Very cool. So, so just to summarize then, if I'm a, if I'm a buyer of potential technology or I'm part of a team that's going through a digital transformation of any sort, um, what sort of closing advice, if you had to summarize everything we just talked about here today and sort of bring it back up to the, the highest level, you know, what, what sort of closing advice would you have for people in terms of how they think about user experience in their digital transformations? I know it's a very broad question. That's might be difficult mm. to answer, but how would you summarize that? So without, let's get past the face. Okay. Cause uh, you know, you judge a book by its cover. Yes, we talked about it. And yes, it needs to look good. Okay. But it really needs to deliver on what the business is asking for. And I think that trumps at the highest level, what it looks like, even though that matters to get buy-in and get acclimation at the business. User adoption, so the things no. that I, yeah, user adoption, it's all those pieces. Um, but I think the first thing that matters the most is uh, making a, a, a very large decision. Um, it's going to come with a lot of change internal for my department and um, who my department serves, right? The employee base, the user base, the constituents. So I think it's, it's not a feature functionality conversation, but it's more around future proofing. Mm -hmm. And that's a term that we've been using in our organization. So way I look at that as U UX perspective is integrations and extensibility. Those would be the way that I would honestly, I would put that as number one in the list mm. from a UX perspective. And that's because I would tell you, sure, you can mandate the way in which a given role wants to work and you can mandate what systems and tools they have access to, but the way that they compose and aggregate that to the way they want to digest and perceive information and, and, and uh, perform a task you get into like different shades or gradients of it, mm -hmm. even though they might be the same role. So integrations and extensibility is really important because you want to amplify user personalization um, because that increases user satisfaction. So personalization is I want to change things. I want to alter the layout um, or you delivered me this mobile uh, application, but I only want to see these two or three things. I don't want to see everything else. That to right. me is noise. I'm good. I got people for that, you know, so to speak. So integration extensibility, really important. I would put that number one on the UX, which is then number two. 
I would look at how well can configuration be handled um, in an application that you might not potentially want to integrate other things or extend to other things. So configuration to me is number two. So integration extensibility, configuration number two. Hmm. Um, and that's because right there at those steps, whoa, baby, in my opinion, you have a future-proof solution, which means I can solve for things as they occur and where they come without having to always account for what am I getting right now? Hmm. Like, what am I buying right now? Um, then I get into number three would be how does it look? And if I have to take advantage of configuration and the integration extensibility of the solution, are there ways for me to orchestrate and assemble in a meaningful way? Um, because that right there solves the earlier tenured or new tenured employee base. And it gives you a story to tell and speeds and feeds to get tenured and hyper rich knowledge users to potentially start seeing a new way to do work. Mm. And that's why I would sum up those as the top three. Interesting. That's very cool. Yeah, that's a great, a great summary and, and thing to think about. And I love how you, you've done a good job of framing user experience and all the stuff we've talked about today, you're framing it in the context of usability and functionality and what the software can do in that future proof mindset that a lot of organizations are, are striving for. Um, so I love how you, how you talked about the, the interaction between the two. So in other words, it's, you know, it needs to look good, but it also has to do what you want it to do. And you have to know that going forward in the future, you're going to be able to solve those problems and, and the user adoption longer term is going to, is going to work well for your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you cool. so much for being here today. And I really appreciate it. Uh, this is a great conversation. It yeah, flew no by, uh, and um, I had a feeling it would, and it did fly by. So thank you for being here. I'd love to have you back on again. And uh, I really uh, appreciate, I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for the questions. I think they were awesome. I apologize. I, I tend to talk too much. Uh, that's the right. Italiano that's, in me, but that's all good. You know, hey, that's why you're here. I, it's for you to do all the talking. <laughs> and people are tired of hearing me talk. So they, they want to hear uh, someone else talk here on, on this podcast. So thank you for uh, taking some of the pressure off me. So, um, and, and really appreciate the audience. Audience had some great questions as well. Thank you for, for, uh, listening in and, and chiming in with your questions as well. Again, this conversation, this recording will get polished, edited up, and we'll add some additional content to it to make our full transformation ground control episode for next week. So be sure to check that out. You can go to transformationgroundcontrol.com to listen to the podcast on all the different audio podcast platforms, or you can watch it, uh, the video version of it as well at that same website. Just go to transformationgroundcontrol.com. Um, thank you for being here today. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. And thank you again, Noon, for being here. And uh, we'll see you all yeah. soon. Awesome. Right, Thanks, everyone. everyone.